Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President, as well. President Obama, as a candidate for your office, you said that you wanted to see the assault ban weapon, the ban on assault weapons reinstated. Mm -hmm. Your Attorney General has spoken in favor of this. Mexican officials have also spoken in favor of it. But we haven't heard you say that since you took office. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to keep your promise? And if not, how do you explain that to the American people? Oh, and uh, President Calderon, I'm sorry if I may, would you like to see this ban reinstated? And have you raised that today with President Obama? Thank yeah. you. Well, first of all, uh, we did discuss this extensively in our meetings. Uh, I have not backed off at all from my belief that uh, the, gun uh, the assault weapons ban made sense. Uh, and uh, I continue to believe that uh, we can uh, respect uh, and honor the Second Amendment rights in our Constitution, uh, the rights of sportsmen and hunters and homeowners who want to uh, keep their families safe uh, to lawfully bear arms, uh, while dealing with assault weapons that, uh, as we now know here in Mexico, are uh, helping to fuel uh, extraordinary violence, uh, violence in our own country as well. Now. Uh, having said that, I think none of us are any, under any illusion that uh, reinstating uh, that ban would be easy. And so what we focused on is how we can improve our enforcement of existing laws. Because even under current law, trafficking illegal firearms, sending them across the border, is illegal. That's something that we can stop. And so our focus is to work with uh, Secretary Napolitano, uh, Attorney General Holder, our entire uh, Homeland Security team, ATF, Border Security, everybody who's involved in this, to coordinate with our counterparts in Mexico to significantly ramp up our enforcement of existing laws. And in fact, I've asked Eric Holder to do a, a complete review of how, law, how our enforcement operations are currently working uh, and make sure that we're cutting uh, down on the uh, loopholes that are resulting in uh, some of these uh, drug trafficking problems. Last point I would make uh, is that there are going to be some opportunities where I think we can build some strong consensus. I'll give you one example and that is the issue of gun tracing, or, or the, the, the tracing of bullets and ballistics and gun information that have been used in major crimes. That's information that we are still not giving to law enforcement as a consequence of uh, provisions that have been blocked in uh, the United States Congress. And those are the areas where I think that we can make some significant progress early. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're steering away from the issue of the assault gun, guns ban, but it does mean that we want to act with urgency promptly now, uh, and I think we can make significant progress. One more thing, one more thing I forgot to mention. One other thing we can do is to track the weapons that we have in Mexico. If we manage to detect weapons sold illegally in the United States in violation of this law on the control of weapons exports, or if in the United States they can have uh, probably move forward on a good registry of armament or on the prohibition of certain massive sales of uh, weapons, for example, to a hunter or to a common citizen. We know that these people uh, do not usually buy uh, hundreds of rifles or assault weapons or of grenades. If we can move forward in those areas, I do believe that security, both of Mexico and Mexico, and uh, both of the United States and Mexico, will improve because those weapons are pointing against Mexican people and Mexican officials today. But crime is not only acting in Mexico; it is also acting in the United. United States. Organized crime is acting in both countries, and I do hope that those weapons that are sold today in the United States and are being used in Mexico, I hope the day will never come in which they will also be used against the North American society or against U.S. officials, just like they are 
now being used in Keeping them on us follow up now. There's new information tonight on what the Justice Department knew about a controversial tactic of letting guns get into the hands of drug cartels in Mexico and other criminals. There wasn't just Operation Fast and Furious. It turns out even earlier there was Operation Wide Receiver. Newly released documents reveal the head of the Justice Department's criminal division learned about that previous ATF operation as early as April of last year. He only recently brought it to the attention of Attorney General Eric Holder. Lenny Breuer testified on Capitol Hill today. I was involved in this exercise, and as all of this has come to light, that I, in thinking about it, realized that I should have back in April of 2010 drawn that connection. I've expressed that regret first personally to the Attorney General of the United States, and then I determined that I should do it publicly as well. Well, Brewer says he simply didn't draw a connection between the two gun programs. Of course, the, the programs that gained the most attention is Fast and Furious, which ran from late 2009 to early this year. It's where weapons sold in the U.S. were allowed to fall into the hands of Mexican drug cartels in the hope of tracking them to their most violent members. Didn't work out that way at all. Thousands of the guns were lost, and two of those missing weapons were found at the scene when U.S. border agent Brian Terry was murdered last December. So somewhere along the line, professional law enforcement officers within the ATF or the U.S. or somewhere, somebody in charge of these operations, laid out a completely failed program from the get-go. Mm. It put a lot of people in danger. And but for Brian Terry's death, we probably would have never known about it. Yeah, it's uh, it's so tragic. A uh, border agent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Mr. Holder, let me just uh, try to tie up some loose ends. Um, You agree that on February the 4th, the letter that was written to Senator Grassley that um, with the allegation that ATF sanctioned or otherwise knowingly allowed the sale of assault weapons to a straw purchaser who then transported them into Mexico is false. That letter dated February the 4th, 2011 is itself false. We now know. I'd say what I said is it contains inaccurate information. <clears throat> well, isn't that false? Well, false, I, I, only, I don't want to quibble with you, but false, I think, implies um, people making a, uh, a, uh, uh, a decision to deceive, and that was not what was going on there. People were, were in good faith giving what they thought was correct information to um, Senator Grassley. We now know that that information was not correct. <clears throat> okay, if you won't agree with me, it was false. It's not true. You agree with that, right? I'd say it's not accurate. It's not accurate. Mm-hmm. Did the person who wrote this letter on February the 4th, 2011, have they ever been disciplined or otherwise uh, been held accountable for providing false information to, uh, to a United States senator? Well, as I indicated, the people who wrote the letter acted in good faith, thought that what they were sending was, in fact, accurate information. The people who were supplying the information thought that it was accurate. At some point, somebody in that chain uh, did not have, did not put, give, uh, give good information. And that's one of the things that the Inspector General, I hope, will be able to determine. Did Lanny Brewer know, uh, know better than what was represented in the February the 4th letter? Um, he was... Uh, was he privy to either of these two memos, the uh, July 5th, 2010? He said he was briefed April 2010. And by the way, what office does uh, Lanny Brewer hold in the Department of Justice? He's the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division. And um, why would Lanny Brewer, knowing as he did back in July, to April 2010, about Operation Fast and Furious, allow a letter that went out on the department stationery February the 4th, 2011, why would he let a letter that was false um, represent the position of the Department of Justice? Well, first off, the briefing, the blue one, AAG Brewer brief, that was about wide receiver. That wasn't about fast and furious. By the way, do you know the differences between wide receiver and fast and furious? I mean, do I know that they're, they're different operations? Right. And so do you know the differences, the factual differences between wide receiver and fast and furious? I know that, well, I mean, yeah, there are a number of differences, both, I think, in scope, um, both in terms of time. The, the Bush administration was the one that started wide receiver. The Obama administration is where Fast and Furious began. Are you winging this, or do you actually know? I know this. You know this? Do you know that uh, wide receiver was done in conjunction with the government of Mexico, and the intention of the plan was to follow the weapons, and neither 
was there the uh, intention to follow the weapons on Fast and Furious, nor did Mexico know that the United States government was uh, allowing guns to walk into the hands of the cartels. Did you know that? Senator, I have not tried to equate the two. I have not tried to equate wide receiver with, uh, with, with Fast and Furious. I'm that just is asking not... you, if you know if you know the differences between the two. Sure. And I, I, as, as what I know about wide receiver, what you have said um, is, in fact, is, in fact, correct. There are memos that talk about gun walking that are related to wide receiver. But uh, again, I'm not trying to equate the two. When you got Senator Grassley's letter um, on January the 30th, 2011, why didn't you investigate? I did. I asked people on my staff to, uh, to look into the materials that, or the concerns that were raised in the letters. It was a January 27th letter, I believe, and a January 30th letter. I think there were two letters that he gave me on, I think maybe the 30th or 31st, something like that. And I asked people on my staff to look in, uh, into that, and they did. And they started asking questions within the department about uh, the, the thing, the matter, the material that was contained in the uh, Senator Grassley letter. And of course, that was uh, just shortly after the letter that Senator Grassley gave you was shortly after the well publicized murder of Brian Terry, the United States law enforcement agent. Right. And to be clear, the letters were addressed to um, acting, uh, the acting head of, of ATF, um, Ken Melson, but he gave them to Who me. Who works on, for you? He gave them to me on January 31st. Right. And so does. Uh, I believe that you told uh, Senator Whitehouse that you thought your staff made the right decision in not bringing fast and furious tactics to your attention. Is that correct? No, that's okay. not correct. Okay. What I said was that there was no indication in the materials that they reviewed uh, that contained anything about the tactics that were used in Fast and Furious. And as a result, there was no need for them to bring to my attention the reports. Uh, if, in fact, there was in those uh, those reports, indications of gun walking or something like that, I think they should have brought that to my attention, but that was not contained in the reports. And that is what um, Assistant Attorney General Brewer said was the mistake that he made. When he heard about um, gun walking, he should have brought that to my attention or to the attention of the Deputy Attorney General. Can you name me one person who's been held accountable for this uh, Fast and Furious operation? And this Just right. one in the Department of Justice. The way to make government responsible is to hold it accountable. And the way to make government accountable is to make it transparent so that the American people can know exactly what decisions are being ma made, how they're being made, and whether their interests are being well served. The directives I am giving my administration today on how to interpret the Freedom of Information Act will do just that. For a long time now, there's been too much secrecy in this city. The old rules said that if there was a defensible argument, for not disclosing something to the American people, then it should not be disclosed. That era is now over. Starting today, every agency and department should know that this administration stands on the side, not of those who seek to withhold information, but those who seek to make it known. To be sure, issues like personal privacy and national security must be treated with the care they demand. But the mere fact that you have the legal power to keep something secret does not mean you should always use it. Freedom of Information Act is perhaps the most powerful instrument we have for making our government honest and transparent and of holding it accountable. And I expect members of my administration not simply to live up to the letter, but also the spirit of this law. I will also hold myself as president to a new standard of openness. Going forward, any time the American people want to know something that I or a former president wants to withhold, we will have to consult with the Attorney General and the White House Counsel, whose business it is to ensure compliance with the rule of law. Information will not be withheld just because I say so. It will be beheld, uh, withheld because a separate authority believes my request is well grounded in the Constitution. Let me say it as simply as I can. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. So somewhere along the line, professional law enforcement officers within the ATF or the U.S. Attorney, or somewhere, somebody in charge of these operations, laid out a completely failed program from the get-go. Mm. It put a lot of people in danger. And but for Brian Terry's death, 
we probably would have never known about it. Yeah.